Welcome to Sharing the Mic, Frontline AIDS podcast series. My name is Lois Chingandu, the Interim Executive Director of Frontline AIDS. Over the next six episodes, we will bring together experts, advocates, leaders, and trailblazers to explore pressing issues that impact on people living with and affected by HIV around the world. Frontline AIDS is a partnership made up of community organizations in more than 100 countries. We've been at the forefront of the HIV response for 30 years, taking local, national, and global action on HIV, health, and human rights. We want a fresher, free from AIDS for everyone, everywhere. Will you join us to end it? Now, it's over to Ben Plumley the host of Sharing the Mic. And let me add my welcome. It's terrific to welcome everybody back to a second season of a Shot in the Arm podcast, Sharing the Mic with Frontline Aids. This season, we're going to be doing things a little bit differently in that Frontline Aids is always going to give us a co-host. And I am delighted to welcome our co-host for today's episode, Leora Pillay, who is the Head of Prevention Advocacy at Frontline Aids. Hey, Leora, how are you? Hey, Ben, I'm good. How are you? Yeah, not doing bad. Now, where are you ringing in from? Johannesburg, South Africa. Well, fingers crossed, we don't have any load shedding issues today. Yeah, the power's just come back, so we can hope it stays that way. (laughs) Yeah, everything crossed. Now, we're going to be talking about choice in HIV prevention in this podcast, and I just wondered... What really stands out to you in terms of the new technologies and approaches? Um, And what do you hope we're going to get out of this podcast? You know, when we're thinking about HIV prevention, we really do need new commodities. We need new choice. And so the Depivirin ring and Cabalet um, could be game changers for HIV prevention. Um, So I'm really hoping that from this podcast, we can encourage people to advocate more strongly for these new HIV prevention technologies. Um, and to really get them pushed in each country and accessible to populations who need them. Because without it, we're not going to go further um, in our fight against HIV. No, I completely agree. Um, And our two guests for this podcast, I think, will really help us navigate those, those choppy waters. So should we get right into it? Our first guest is Patricia Jaconia, who is an alumni of A Shot in the Arm podcast, Patricia is the project director of Mosaic at LVCT Health. Hey, Patricia, welcome back to the show. Hi, Ben, and thank you so much for inviting me again. Oh, it's really good to see you. And and I said Mosaic, uh, which I know is an acronym. Can you tell us what it stands for? Yes, thank you. So uh, Mosaic stands for Maximizing Options to advance informed choice for HIV prevention. It's a USAID funded grant that I'm leading its implementation in Kenya and it's in 10 other countries. Wow, hey Leora, that that sounds entirely up our street for today's show, right? Definitely, I'm sure she's got a lot of good information for us. So Patricia, same question to you. Any prevention technology or approach that is exciting you at the moment? Uh, Yes, quite a number. I I think the most exciting thing is that the basket for HIV prevention is expanding and the future looks brighter. So we are now just moving from what we we have had in the basket that is largely male controlled, but we are slowly moving towards um, female controlled products like the ring. And we have other discrete products that are coming up like the injectable cabotegravir and others are coming. So that's, that is really exciting. There'll be something for everyone. Something for everyone. I love it. I love it. Well, that's choice. And our final guest today is someone I've been dying to get onto the podcast for quite a while. Uh, she's been a really big mentor to me over the years um, and really speaks to um, that nuance of the HIV movement that has really I think, connected the dots between sociology, science, um, and it is the wonderful Judy Auerbach, who is um, a sociologist by training. She's got strong interests in 
uh, HIV prevention, particularly for girls and women. She's a professor at uh, UCSF, um, and it's fantastic that you can join us. Hi there, Judy. Hi there, Ben, Leora, Patricia. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. So, so Judy, given your background, what do you think is the most exciting thing on the horizon for HIV prevention? Again, it can be a technology or an approach um, or even a policy question. Well, much like Patricia, I think the most exciting thing is that people, all kinds of people now have increased numbers of options for HIV prevention. And what I'm excited about is that part of the conversation, in addition to the modalities themselves, is about increasing uptake and access, which means making uh, endowing people with more agency and control so that not only do they get to choose a product but, but or an approach, uh, with greater options available to them, but also thinking about ways to make it easier to use those products, um, allowing people to do things at home, for example, taking things out of a clinical environment and putting them more in a community environment. So that that part of the discussion also excites me. Thank you. Well, I'm really looking forward to this to this conversation. Um, <clears throat> Leora, our first. Uh, discussion area today is about the importance of choice um, uh, and why it's so important. And I don't know if you want to kick it off and just give us some thoughts on what Frontline AIDS position is on this, but but also how you see the partnership of Frontline AIDS um, helping um, country implementers um, really bring these uh, approaches to girls and women. I think as uh, Patricia and Judy have said it so well that, you know, people need choice. I think, you know, condoms and oral prep, although have been amazing commodities in the HIV prevention fight, have not been enough. Oral prep doesn't fit into the lifestyle of many people. Um, some, some young women and girls can't take oral prep. Um, if you think of the lives of sex workers who possibly move around and can't get their next, subs you know, their next prescription for their, their, their pills. Um, oral prep just doesn't work. So we do need longer acting options. And I think that's why this is so important. But also, as Patricia highlighted, that women controlled and discreet options are really, really important, especially where you see countries um, like South Africa that have an epidemic of gender-based violence. A woman needs to be able to protect herself um, discreetly when she wants to, how she wants to. So I think that's really, really key. Frontline AIDS has been really working on the global level um, and the national level to try and uh, really get these products registered um, because they're not registered in all countries as yet, but also make sure that we work with the um, pharmaceutical companies, et cetera, around access, availab ab availability, excuse me, and pricing. So I think you know, the Frontline AIDS Partnership, uh, which is a huge global um, HIV partnership, um, can really play a huge role in trying to increase the access to these commodities um, and using the voices of communities on the ground in countries across the continent to call for these products and try and hold governments accountable and trying to get them as quickly as possible into the hands of the communities that need them. Yeah, and I think that is a very nice uh, a diving board for us to sort of get into the the nitty gritty. And um, Patricia, LVCT Health is a partner organization of, of Frontline AIDS. Um, LVCT Health started off as a voluntary counseling and testing organization. I think you're celebrating 20 years this year, aren't you? So how has prevention uh, factored into the work that you've done? And... Um, uh, how successful do you think you've been? Uh, thank you, Ben, for um, that question. And yes, LVCT is celebrating 20 years. Uh, this Thursday, it's 20th of April, so we are really excited. And we have come a long way. And um, a lot of our work is actually centered around prevention. Um, if I think of our gender-based violence work, it's centered around prevention um, and then HIV, we've really been heavy on prevention, but then also uh, the other part of the response, which is uh, care and treatment. Um, 
And for prevention, we we take the combination prevention approach, uh, which looks at the biomedical, the structural and behavioral interventions, uh, because we believe just having the biomedical services alone has not been able to give us the solution. We have to work on the human behavior. We have to address other structural issues, um, like responding to gender-based violence and gender inequalities that exist that really predisposes um, people to um, be more vulnerable to HIV. So prevention really has been key and central in the work that LVCT does. And our main focus has been adolescents and young people, more specifically adolescent girls and young, uh, uh, and, and adolescent girls and young women. And we also have the key populations and other vulnerable populations. And, and so coming to you, Judy, um, hearing um, Leora and hearing Patricia, again, you're, you're the master of joining the dots, as it were, or the mistress of joining the dots. Um, how do you think the field overall has responded to the prevention needs over the last decades? We've obviously moved from just put a condom on it, um, but uh, and we've had some successes, particularly uh, around PEPFAR's dreams. But uh, does it concern you that we're not really doing enough yet? Right. Very complex question, Ben, because it begins with the who, who's the we and the we, and we can have a whole discussion, a philosophical discussion about that, but we're not going to today, I don't think. But it does matter because it's who's asking the questions about what kinds of HIV prevention should be pursued in any kind of context. But I think the more relevant um, response to, to your query is really about how choice is a concept that takes place in a context. And I think we're We've optimized our efforts, particularly in science, and then it's translation to medical um, activities and uh, technologies for HIV prevention and also treatment. Where we've optimized that is in uh, doing kind of clinical trials of what will become products, kind of uh, consumer-based products that people can get and use. And where we've done less is in a, and, and so there may be choice in, you know, using an oral prep or using a vaginal ring or using an injectable, that's the product and there's more theoretical choice. But any of those is affected by the context in which we live. And as Patricia was also saying, you know, this includes things at the individual level. Let's, let us not forget people's own psychology and their own makeup. So you have some internal conversations about who you are, what you want to do. You have relationships with an individual and a partnership and others in your network. You live in a community and that community is located in a physical and a social environment, a cultural environment. And there are a lot of factors operating at each of those levels that affect our ability to exercise choice, to know what choice is, to know, uh, to see if what we want is available, if it's available and we can take it up because we have some internal you know, constraints um, <clears throat> or fears. There's stigma operating in our communities and in society that make it difficult to take a little blue pill that looks like treatment um, and is associated with HIV stigma. All those sorts of things, not to mention the obvious things like cost, um, those things factor into the ability to exercise choice. And so where I think we've done least well for decades, as you mentioned, Ben, in the response is to, to really focus on the psychological, the social, and the structural factors that may not be and probably aren't HIV specific, but very much affect whatever we do in HIV. Um, and while there's a lot of language around that these days, I don't think there's as much action. You know, Judy, I can remember a presentation at a, in around mm, 2000, I think maybe at the, the Durban AIDS conference, where a... Um, physician researcher, I think from Johns Hopkins, was waxing lyrical about the use of nevirapine single dose for the prevention of mother-to-child transmission. And, and he said in all, uh, I guess, naive honesty, just give nevirapine to every single woman and we bring HIV under control within five years. I'm like, no. Oh. And so we're always looking at magic biotechnological um, bullets, as it were, to to sort of bring this to a close. But I think it, it, it's really interesting that you you sort of factor in the real life experiences. Um, 
Leora, as you've listened to this sort of first part of the conversation, what are your thoughts? What do you think? Um, uh, how do we really move from joining the dots at the country level to the policy level? I mean, I couldn't, I just, as, as Judy was speaking, I was just nodding the whole time because I think we don't focus enough on structural issues and they sort of, we can have as many commodities and prevention, you know, uh, you know, abilities of available, but it doesn't matter if you've got a young woman and girl who is sitting in a house, um, or in a violent relationship and can't access it, or there's many, many other issues, psychological issues. So I think. Um, what Judy was saying was so true. I think that, um, unfortunately, though, we're still quite far in terms of making it um, possible and getting to the point where we're actually going to have this in the hands of people who need it. So I think um, from, you know, we still got a really long way to go in terms of making sure that the these commodities are accessible in the country level. We've got lots of countries where the commodities are not accessible, are not registered, um, and we've got a lot of stumbling blocks. So I think, um, unfortunately, Ben, uh, we've still got a, a long road ahead of us. Yeah, I think that that is a, a, a big message that all of us understand that, that, you know, we're well on the journey, but we're nowhere near, nowhere near the end in sight. Um, but maybe that that sort of takes us to a conversation then about the actual technologies that we're talking about. Um, and I, I had proposed we called this bit, you know, getting the skinny on um, HIV prevention technologies. And um, Patricia, I want to come to you in a moment, particularly to see that from the, you know, Nairobi perspective, what is, um, you know, the most exciting technology for you. But, but I don't know, Leora, do you want to just give us a a summary on what those new technologies are. We've we've sort of covered them um, at top line level so far. The injectable, the depiverine ring. So the depiverine ring is a is a silicone ring um, that is a, a ring that a woman or a girl can insert into her vagina every twenty eight days, um, and it release, releases a prep into the body and protects her from vaginal sex. Um, but it will not protect uh, protect the woman or girl from oral um, or anal sex. So they can still uh, get HIV through that way. Um, but it is the first sort of uh, self-administered HIV prevention tool. Um, and then there is uh, injectable PrEP, which is a uh, shortened Cabalet. And Cabalet is, um, needs to still be injected by a clinician but uh, is long acting and can last in a woman for a few months. And so um, it's particularly good for populations um, and women and girls who may be mobile and may not be able to access um, a community clinic or a community service as regularly as possible. So in that way, I think, um, you know, it's going to be a game changer. It also doesn't need someone to carry around, you know, their pills, um, in their pocket uh, with the risk of losing them or getting them stolen, etc. So Care Ballet, once, once you've had the injections, you are safe for a period of time. Patricia, I'm, I don't know the state of registration of either of these technologies in, um, in Kenya, but um, either from um, an implementation or from a research perspective, um, is LVCT Health using or planning to use um, either of them anytime soon? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, so just probably to give a brief in terms of the approvals in countries. So we got uh, the Dapivirin ring approved by our Pharmacy and Poisons Board in July of 2021. Um, and of course, there have been issues of really going public about it uh, because there are still very many implementation questions that the ministry would want uh, responded to before they can confidently, you know, speak about the the uh, massive rollout of the ring. Uh, we are still waiting for approval um, of the for cabotegravir, long acting injectable. So when that comes out, then we'll be able to move on with the next steps. But I think as a country, we have made uh, strides in the right direction. 
uh, we've been able to sit down as the uh, prep technical working group and really develop guidelines uh, that would help um, even at the level of implementation science research. So LVCT is really privileged um, uh, to be one of the organizations that will be rolling out as an implementation science study to support with um, responding to questions in real life implementation of the ring. What does that look like? How do you do the demand generation? Who are these women who would choose the ring and they have all these other products? What are those things that influence them? Um, what are these other factors? When we think about the community, uh, their intimate partners, uh, their friends, that si si the social circle they have around them, how does that influence some of the decisions that women make in terms of the choices um, that they settle on? And so we are really excited at this point. We've gotten ethical approval uh, for the study uh, in country. And uh, we are now at the point where we are preparing the study sites, preparing our researchers, and we should be uh, launching the study in um, early, early June. So we are really gearing towards having the first uh, participants being put on the ring, and we want to collect as much evidence as possible uh, that would really set the, the pace for the next steps that are coming and be able to invest in the health system good enough so that uh, even when we have the injectable coming on board, we are not, uh, you know, like kind of reinventing the wheel, but just riding on the systems that are already existing uh, because countries do not want to put in a lot of investments again uh, for every new product that comes. So we are thinking about sustainability and how do we develop the system in such a way that you quickly layer on uh, the new products that are coming. Do you do you offer oral prep to clients of LVCT Health at the moment? Yes, we do. So LVCT was uh, one of the first organizations in Kenya to conduct a demonstration study uh, for oral prep. And we did this amongst uh, adolescent girls and young women, female sex workers and men who have sex with men. And since then, we still contribute significantly uh, to the PrEP targets in the country. Uh, we cover around 33 out of the 47 counties in Kenya. And uh, we remain a very strategic partner in terms of providing uh, technical support uh, with uh, PrEP programming at national level. And we also work at sub-national level to support um, our ministries of health to roll out, to build capacity, to look at the guidelines, to work with uh, peer, education, uh, peer educators networks and just see how all these various levels, even at community level, we can make it easy for people to be able to access oral prep. So we are really happy that at this point we are starting to think about the other new products and we want to generate as much evidence as possible that this is what it takes to do it, and uh, these are some of the possible strategies, the possible populations we should be looking at so that from the word go, learning from key lessons that we got from oral prep to avoid stigmatizing a product, you know, by, for example, going to just a specific population and making people begin to think that this product is just for a particular group of people. And then it makes a lot of people not really think about their own uh, risk or vulnerabilities um, to HIV infection. It's all about implementation, isn't it? And I guess, Judy, um, I, I, I would really love to know how, what your response is to what you've heard from uh, both Leora and um, Patricia. Um, I, I got to say, on the one hand, I feel really excited about the innovation that's coming out of um, groups like LVCT Health, but. Um, I've been a, a, a very, very long, too long supporter of microbicides. And the whole idea of um, the ring, which is a form of a microbicide, was that it was um, a technology essentially developed by and for women. And yet here we are in 2023 and we're only now looking at, um, you know, operations, implementation, science studies. Does, does this frustrate you? Have we, have we not really adapted our traditional R&D process adequately enough to put girls and women's first? Well, um, 
<laughs> As I was seeing your poster from 1996 and even thinking about this conversation, I was thinking about the long march to the point we are at today. And you've now given me a nice segue to, to say a few things about that. Because when we talk about what's in the so-called toolkit, uh, what's available to us for HIV prevention, currently we're focusing on the most recent developments like the vaginal ring and oral and injectable prep particularly for women, but also for other populations as well. And I started thinking about, boy, when I started in this field and, uh, you know, there were male condoms, then there were so-called female condoms, which nobody talks about anymore. But the research suggests that female condoms are highly effective in preventing HIV, but they're not particularly well used or they're used in some places and not others. So what happened with that whole discussion? Then the whole field, as you mentioned, Ben, of microbicides emerged chiefly to be for and about women, as you said, but it also became a very important topic for gay men and anybody who practices anal sex and looking at um, both vaginal and anal erectile microbicides. And we went through a whole march of compounds from this horrible N9, which was an existing spermicide. I think you all are too young to remember this, but um, there were some early studies looking at whether that could be an HIV prevention strategy, particularly for women and for men. Um, and that was, you know, a, a failure, so to speak, because the evidence was no efficacy and, in fact, some harm from monoxyl 9 in that way. Then we had research on the diaphragm. Do you remember the diaphragm? Um, there were clinical trials showing whether the diaphragm or assessing whether the diaphragm, the female birth control diaphragm, could protect the cervix sufficiently and thereby reduce HIV infection. And that also showed no efficacy, no harm, but no real efficacy um, in, in clinical trials. And so it went on. And then we had the gel, which particularly in South Africa was a very huge finding and presentation. I think it was 2010 um, at the AIDS, International AIDS Conference, got a big standing room ovation because it was the first microbicide-like entity showing um, some efficacy. But the efficacy was fairly low by standards, you know, 39% or um, something like that. Um, and then we moved to oral prep, and the story continues to what we're talking about today, various forms of oral prep and now long-acting injectables and the vaginal ring. And part of what's in that whole story where I think things have gotten tricky is about who gets to decide what is efficacious enough to allow for its use. And so then we get into science and the you know, hegemony, the predominance of clinical research over everything in, in the response to HIV prevention and HIV generally. So things are driven by clinical researchers and clinical trials and the standards for conducting those trials and interpreting their outcomes. And that's a whole mess of stuff from statistics to, you know, uh, retention, I mean, all manner of things. So, and then we have, um, the regulatory bodies, which I think Patricia and, and, and others have talked about, that make decisions based on that science of what's reasonable to approve for use. So safety and efficacy are both very much um, the, the factors of, of note. So that then is part of what constrains people's, enables and constrains people's choices in what's available. So the whole discussion about <clears throat> who gets to decide what's efficacious enough for use is, I think, part of what I get frustrated about. So in the case of the vaginal ring, we have advocates for women in particular who are saying, look, this, the research says 39% to 54% efficacy in the context of clinical trials. But if there are a whole lot of women out there who want to use it and they use it correctly, that's going to work for them. And so, you know, this those findings are based on very large scale trials and you know, all the statistical permutations that go with them. So do advocates for women have as much say in what is determined to be appropriate for people to use as do biomedical scientists? I think that's a part of what I get frustrated about is back to the whose voice matters in determining what we look at, how we look at it, and what we decide once we look at it. And I mean, you are uh, an eminent politician as well as a passionate advocate. And I could see it coming across in your answer, Judy. Um, how did you feel about the FDA's decision not to approve the dipivirine ring? And um, that was significant because, of course, initially that then meant that uh, without FDA approval, PEPFAR, the U.S. government's major or the U.S. citizen, I should say, is with the taxpayers. We pay for it. You know, the major uh, uh, global HIV funding initiative could not purchase 
uh, the de Piverine ring, even if countries and communities wanted it. Uh, was that a real example, do you think, of the kind of frustration we all feel? Yeah, but it also is a good example of how complex these decisions are. So the FDA did not even get to decide uh, whether to approve the vaginal ring or not because the application was pulled by the manufacturer, IPM, before that decision was going to be made. But it was pulled on their belief, the company's firm belief, that the FDA would not approve it because of the low, relatively low efficacy rates from the trials. And so their argument, I believe, at the time was, let's save everybody the time and trouble, given that we doubt this is going to get approved anyway, and let's focus on places where it might get approved, so the European Medicines Association and so on, which did approve it, and the WA did uh, recommend. So um, the fact that it never went through FDA approval and the signals looked like it wouldn't pass muster in the FDA for the U.S. meant, as he said, Ben, that U.S. government agencies that provide prevention technologies to people uh, could not support it and provide it. And it was a real dilemma for PEPFAR. I mean, in the spirit of full disclosure, I'm on the PEPFAR Scientific Advisory Board, and we had some very, very intense conversations about this. And I am actually not even sure exactly what's happening now. You, you all, three of you probably know much more than I do. Um, but the sense was that, yeah, there's an actual you know, restriction. It, it's a real policy law restriction on PEPFAR to be able to provide something, even if it's compelled, even if its leadership and its program implementers are compelled to want to offer the ring. They're just precluded from it by law. So how do you get around that? And one of the constraints I mentioned that even if an or and you know a large organization like PEPFAR, a big funder and supporter of H the HIV response, chooses something, it has the choice of a vaginal ring in theory, because the product exists it itself is constrained by these very major legal and policy um, restrictions. So um, I I don't know what's going to happen with that in the end. Maybe you all have more information than I do. I, I had heard that some pilot studies were being considered and thought about. I mean, uh, Leora, Patricia, I don't know if you've got any more information on that. I think Patricia probably, yeah. Yeah, sure. So um, I think the only commitment uh, that PEFA has given so far is that uh, they will be able to uh, put in um, investment only for the uh, studies. And so, for example, the study we are about to roll out, the rings will actually be financed by uh, PEFA through USAID. Uh, but uh, beyond the studies, now that is what is not confirmed uh, by PEPFAR. Uh, but of course, um, various countries and um, advocates are already beginning to really put the spanner into the works and begin to talk to um, other funders. There are conversations that are ongoing with Global Fund, even as countries are preparing their applications for uh, the current cycle. So there are opportunities, but I must say it is really difficult um, uh, because when uh, the news about... Um, the US FDA came out. Um, I remember WHO convened a meeting and where a lot of advocates really joined that forum and expressed uh, their desire to be given an opportunity to try the ring, you know, and, and women spoke very loudly and clearly. Um, a number of them saying they felt they were used and now they've been left without an option. And for women, for example, who had already uh, identified the ring as their best option, given their circumstances. So I believe this is a conversation that will not end soon, uh, but will continue. And even as people rely on the evidence that will come out of the implementation uh, science studies, uh, we will go back to the drawing board and really repackage and begin to look at how do we uh, start up this conversation again, uh, potentially with PEPFAR and uh, other development partners. I mean, it certainly makes you think, doesn't it, that the Europeans, uh, having uh, approved uh, the ring, also need to to step up. Um, but, you know, Leora, one of the things that really strikes me in this conversation, we haven't yet talked about the uh, the very significant elephant in the room when it comes to access, and that sort of... Uh, Price, 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 and mm. I, uh, I don't know what your thoughts are and what Frontline AIDS's position is around. Yeah, it's sort of a bit of a chicken and the egg, isn't it? You know, 
uh, manufacturers will say, well, we can't really talk about price until we have a sense of the volume, but how can public health agencies think about volume until they know what the price is? So what do you think? I think price is a humongous issue. Um, and I think for Care Ballet more so, just because of the fact that uh, Vive Healthcare, although um, the medicines patent pool has just, I think, two weeks ago, um, approved three licenses for generic um, production of Cabale. Because the formulation is so complex, they estimate that it might take between three and five years, which means we might be waiting between three and five years before we get generics, which will be cheaper. Um, and so we are going to be sitting with the fact that we don't actually yet know the true price of it. We know what's more expensive. Um, and so there's a lot of talk about, uh, you know, how many more times than oral prep, um, it is, how many more, you know, dollars it is. But I think one of the biggest issues also been that we need to think about and tackle, um, which has recently become a, you know, a hot topic is alongside the price of Caballet, um, it's been released that there's most likely going to be less supply, um, of the drug available and so with PEPFAR not purchasing the ring they have announced I think it's six countries that they will pay for Cabalet in and the Global Fund has also announced a number of countries that they will pay for Cabalet in but now the big elephant in the room is is there going to be enough Cabalet um, for all of these countries and we've got some countries that have registered other countries that haven't but at the point now, we're at the point now where actually sort of, you know, advocating for registration is one thing, but if there's no, you know, and then fighting about the price is another, but there may actually be very little supply. And what we also don't want to see is we don't want to see one funder, for example, purchasing all the available supply of, um, of the Cavalet for their countries, because it goes back to the question or the point that Judy was making was around who decides where it goes. Um, and so I think those are big, big, you know, issues and topics now that we need to start tackling. You, you say that, Leora, and I, my mind immediately goes to the COVID vaccines and this whole question of vaccine nationalism. Um, mm. But I also r realize, Leora, that I have pretty much hogged the, hogged the question questioning of the podcast so far. I can't help it, big mouth plumly. But I mean, are there things that you know you you'd want to ask our guests that you know we haven't covered and that we we really ought to? I mean, I'd be really keen to hear um, from Judy's perspective uh, around um, Cabalet and the supply issue. Um, and the fact that it could take three to five years uh, for generic manufacturers. Um, and so we might be sitting with a very constrained supply in, you know, with, for the next three years. And we're sitting with the fact that the Depivirin ring is not registered by the FDA. Um, what do you think anyone can sort of do about that? Oh, boy. <clears throat> um there are two things that I think we should think about. This is a little bit of a roundabout from your question because, um, you know, all the sort of regulatory and supply chain things is not really my area of expertise. But what I would say is let's not forget all the other prevention options that are available so that we don't keep talking about things as a one off or a, a zero sum or it's only Cavalier or it's only the ring or it's only oral prep. But where there are shortages of supply of one thing, let's not lose sight of the possibilities of working on making more available and more attractive the prevention technologies and approaches that we currently do have. That's one. And that, you know, funders will pay for. The other is where I always land in these conversations, again, as Ben says, I tend to connect dots and I'm sort of a systems thinker and I look kind of at the very high level of things. Um, we keep running into some of the same problems because the capacity to, to, to research, develop, and manufacture these kinds of technologies does not reside in the countries where it needs to. And we, we really have to, we, the collective world of people who care about HIV and other infectious diseases and health more generally, global public health, 
have got to commit to building infrastructure, training, and capacity amongst indigenous people to do the research that's of value to them to produce the product, so to speak, or the technologies or the approaches that are going to work in their communities, and to ensure that there's manufacturing and supply capacity that would also affect pricing, of course, and be affected by pricing, but to have a lot of that located in countries other than the very rich so-called uh, global north. And this, to Ben's point about the vaccines, this came up around the vaccines for COVID as well as, you know, establishing hubs uh, to, as a starting point where there's already some level of significant scientific expertise in countries uh, around the world and then assisting with the manufacturing and development and distribution and supply chain issues. Um, you know, we've got to start somewhere and I just don't see that happening. And it seems to me that we could spend a whole lot of money on developing these products and then just not having, as you say, or enough supply or choosing products that aren't going to be taken up by people who, who really want some appropriate form of HIV prevention in the case of our conversation. So I think putting some attention on, again, who's, who's doing the work uh, and how that is being funded, the capacity uh, the infrastructure, the training and development to produce the kinds of products and approaches that people want in those countries is where we should be putting a lot more attention. And, you know, Lior, if I could, if I could um, offer a few comments to, um, I it strikes me that the HIV field for so long was at the forefront of local slash generic manufacture but of course these were for pills and it's so much easier to manufacture pills but isn't it interesting that in conversations around um the pandemics treaties that's going on at the who and in other conversations um <clears throat> the us the europeans and of course the manufacturers um have been really reticent one might even say hostile to um, the idea of local manufacture, as uh, as Judy describes, these hubs that are across the regions where the need is greatest and where the need is not being met, and I I don't know how you and Patricia feel about that, and and you know particularly this idea that the criticism that perhaps has come back to uh, the global health community that. You know, well, there isn't the capacity, and we need to ensure quality. And um, you, you know, these are not things that necessarily these new hubs could do. You want to have a kick at that, Patricia? Yeah, sure. I think it's a, it's it's such a paradox. I mean, given the the environment right now, when the language is localization, um, and sometimes I think what really uh, disappoints is the lack of intentionality to actually grow that capacity in the countries where you have populations that are most affected by HIV. It would definitely bring a lot of the manufacturing cost lower. Uh, it would give us opportunities to think about efficiency in terms of uh, implementation, um, and even to start looking at some of the local, you know, local solutions, local materials that could easily help in bringing down uh, the cost and even improving uh, accessibility. So I think uh, the, the, the world generally, and especially the West, also has to be very honest. Um, if we are all coming together to actually respond to HIV, we need to do more. We don't have to sit, for example, like now, we are waiting for the rings to come from another country to get into Kenya. And so we will keep shifting our implementation dates based on the transport system. And until it gets here, uh, we keep managing the expectation. Now, if the manufacturing was being done in Kenya, it would be quite simple. I'd just be calling and asking when and quickly have a plan for how to get these products to the facilities. As it is right now, if Kenya was to just announce that we have approved Kabele, I'll be very sorry, I mean, because I'll be telling uh, the users who are very eager and asking about it every other day, I'll tell them, hold your horses. In the meantime, use what is available because of the uncertainties. Like, I don't know when Kenya will finally get, um, you know, capital into the country and have uh, people access it. 
So when we think about the large scale production, when we think about sustainability, and sometimes these are the conversations that make it very difficult when we are talking to government to put in investment in the HIV response. And the biggest question normally is you put in that investment and where does it go to? It's purchasing drugs. I can tell you 70% of our budgets go to purchasing drugs. So you have 30% to be able to do all the other response. But if we had these things right in the region, in our countries, we'd find ways to cut the cost. We'd find ways to really focus on what matters because there is more. For me, it's not just about getting the ring and inserting it. There's a whole process before I get to the ring and insert it. It's not about opening that bottle and swallowing the pill. There's a lot that goes on before anybody makes that decision. Now, we need to start intervening in the process for the person to make the right decision and ensuring that when that decision is made, the product is there. We've experienced shortages even with oral prep, which we imagine should be easy and should be readily available. But we've had times when people go to the facility, number one, you don't have test kits. Why? Because who pays for the test kits? It's largely PEPFAR and Global Fund. Who decides the number of test kits that will come into the country? It's the one who pays for it. The demand might be higher, but because we can't pay for it, we have to work with what is available. So if I'm told there is no test kit, it simply means if I came for PrEP, I can't be given PrEP. It means I have been released to go back to my vulnerability. And if I came back and I'm HIV positive, does it really matter? I had a chance to stop it, but everything around me worked against me. So it's, it's looking at all these other complex things that lead people eventually to zero convert, not because they want it, not because they wish for it, but all this while they were just hoping they could get something that would work for them when they remain healthy and remain HIV negative. So I think intentionality is one thing that we will continue looking out for and seeing how honest this conversation around localization is. It's not just about channeling the money to local organizations. I mean, if you can trust us to implement, to deliver it to the people where they are, when they want it, then you should trust us also to be able to manufacture. So I think for me, that's what sometimes really gets me worked up. Like they, we really need to have an honest conversation, put our money where our mouth is, where our thinking is, and build capacities. There's nothing like saying they don't have the capacity. We go to school. I mean, we have people who are highly educated. They have the skills. And so if we only got the machines and they get a little training, we should be having those things happening here. I'm I'm just struck by um and I think I'm I'm entering Judy's space around sociology, but it just really from what Patricia said really speaks about how we need to hear from more women and girls. We need to hear from more um, you know, populations that are affected, where they calling for these things and, and we need to provide more platforms for them to be able to do that, where someone can tell their story of going into the clinic and being unable to test and being unable to access PrEP um, as a way of trying to get uh, all of these all of these things um, in place that we've just spoken about. Yeah, if I could jump in there, I think to, to Patricia's very eloquent uh, statements about, you know, this issue of capacity and um, the importance of building that and trusting and all of that. It seems to me that, you know, we have PEPFAR, we have Global Fund, and why can't we have a similar global structure or even a bilateral or multilateral structure that focuses on capacity building? PEPFAR has, you know, helped build health systems and, and most of medical associated, but to some degree, some community systems as well that already exist in some form in all the countries that it supports. Why couldn't the U.S. government and the world do something similar with regard to R&D more generally. Um, so that to me is, you know, a big question and I think would go a long way, not just in HIV, but in other pandemic preparedness. The other thing I wanted to mention, if it's okay, I don't want to usurp your questions here, but one thing we haven't really talked about is the political environment um, and how mercurial it can be, which is another factor influencing availability um, of these prevention technologies. 
And while we're focusing a lot on the African continent, look at the U.S., where we have political leaders who are now in cahoots with a lot of folks at a state and local level, very conservative, who say, we don't think that U.S. taxpayer dollars should be spent on uh, drugs for uh, abort medical abortions, as they call them. And they've already started eyeing, and they actually have for a while, PrEP, oral PrEP, and it'll probably affect long-acting. Uh, injectable PrEP as well. And the argument is these are medications, these are drugs that enable people to do things we don't like them doing, which is having sex um, outside of a heteronormative consensual marriage, kind of or non-consensual bit of marriage. And so those folks are influencing the availability and could really threaten access to PrEP in the United States. I mean, we don't have to look that far to see how um, vulnerable we all are when political forces align in a particular way to threaten the accessibility to these kinds of technologies and is obviously a reflection of who uses them and the stigma against, you know, women and girls to begin with as a general category, but also gay and other men who have sex with men, transgender persons, uh, people who use drugs and so on. Uh, so I think we have to really keep our eyes on that as well. Yeah. And uh, of course, if you you look at uh, Kenya, just uh, just next door in Uganda, we have uh, uh, an extraordinary um, discriminatory law coming into, or it's been approved, whether it comes into effect is another matter that, that targets uh, the LGBT community and the ability to provide services, HIV and related health services will become virtually impossible. Um, and yeah, I think we have a much bigger political um, context that we have to be thinking about. Um, and it, it, it's one of the side effects of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Countries in the global south are being asked, you know, which side are you on? And the, the non-aligned movement is, you know, under some pressure here. Um, and so I think this is, if I'm trying to put a positive spin on it, it does at least allow us a renewed opportunity to build global solidarity. Um, but we've been trying to do that for 20 years. Oh, oh my, Leora, we are at the top of the hour for this podcast. And I know you and I wanted to end on a positive note. I think Patricia's given us a fantastic call to action. But what are your thoughts? What should we do? Uh, I really think we need to... Um... You know, we just need to keep on going. We need to keep on uh, doing the advocacy we're doing uh, on the global level as well as the national level. Um, but I really think we need to be um, creating spaces for women and girls and affected populations and marginalized populations to be able to speak um, and be heard by the people, um, by the powers that be. Uh, so that we can get change in place um, and just be really strategic around which battles we fight when and how. But I think, um, you know, whilst we can't change, for example, the supply of Cabalet, um, what we can do is really try and advocate to ensure that um, not one sort of body decides where it all goes. And as Judy said it as well, we can still push all the other HIV prevention, um, you know, options that are available. So all is not lost. We must keep going. So, well, with that, that is the end of this episode. Um, thank you to Leora Pillay, my co-host from Frontline AIDS. It's a real pleasure doing this with you, Leora, and I hope we can do many more and uh, try and get into some real good trouble um, uh, virtually, if not in person. Um <laughs> Uh, a big thank you to Patricia and Judy. Um, I think you've both given us uh, a lot of food for thought and a lot of um, um, impetus to revitalize our advocacy. Um, just want to say a big thank you to our Sharing the Mic producers from Frontline Aids, to uh, Suzanne uh, Fisher-Murphy and also to Ali Liu. Uh, thanks to Eric Espera, our director and producer from Newsdoc Media. And of course, thank you to you, our listeners and viewers. Uh, you can find us on all your favorite podcast platforms. Don't forget to subscribe 
uh, and to give us five stars. And don't forget to find us on our YouTube channel where you can actually see us in person as well as hear our dulcet tones. So everybody, have a great week and a safe week.